This is a fairly new speaker series that we're doing in Washington, D.C. called Tech Policy Rising. Um, for those who may be confused, this is not going to be a debate. This is supposed to be an educational series where we are trying to solve um, the problem of what happens when the tech side of tech policy and the policy side aren't necessarily in communication. Um, so we're trying to bring them together fairly directly um, and have a conversation about emerging issues in the area. So um, without much further ado, I want to turn it over to Julia Ingwin, who is our moderator today, um, a reporter at ProPublica and author of Dragnet Nation, which you can buy on Amazon. Um, however, I do just quickly want to say that our next event we have scheduled is going to be on January 22nd on data retention, um, and the speaker announcement should be coming shortly, but if you want to mark your calendars, um, we will be having that um, just two blocks from here back at our, our home office where hopefully the rest of the events will be as well. Hey, Julia? Great, thank you, Amy. It's so great to be here. Uh, thank you guys for showing up on a cold, snowy day. Um, it is my privilege to introduce two of the most awesome and um, impactful people in the privacy landscape. Um, Chris Segoyan is the chief technologist for the ACLU Speech Privacy and Technology Project, and he's been leading the charge for years against indiscriminate cell phone surveillance. Um, he is best known for uh, when the FBI <laughs> raided his house. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring it up. It's fine. It's all right. <laughs> when um, he built a tool that would um, print fake boarding passes, and um, just to show how weak the security was in that system, um, and I think that gave him a, a lifelong love of FBI raids. <laughs> it gave me a lifelong appreciation for attorneys. Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and on my right is uh, Marcy Wheeler, who is um, uh, known, many of you may know her better by her Twitter handle, <laughs> Empty Wheel. <laughs> um, and uh, this is a great moment because I've never met her in person, and for years we've been Twitter friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> like the all across, I've never even met Chris before. Um, so, Marcy is a journalist and a blogger. She has a PhD in comparative literature which, um, strangely enough, I believe is probably good training for reading and analyzing all these voluminous uh, legal filings created by the intelligence industry. And she does take sort of a very um, literature-like approach, you know, analyzing the very words and their meanings and oftentimes uncovers things that other people have not seen. And she's also the author of the 2007 book, Anatomy of Deceit, How the Bush Administration Used the Media to Sell the Iraq War and Out the Spy. So, um, I thought we should just start, I don't know how familiar all of you are with location tracking, so I thought we could just lay out the landscape and then start talking about the particulars. And there's basically the technical and the legal landscape. So I thought we could start with um, the technical side of it um, with Chris describing sort of how somebody could track you using your phone. Somebody in the government or somebody um, I believe we are talking mostly about government okay. surveillance, but I think you could probably mention, you know, how your neighbors might be able if they wanted to. <laughs> sure. So there are, uh, I guess, at a high level, a few ways that the government might track your location information. The first would be to go to the phone company uh, and ask the phone company to do something, uh, either to hand over records they already have or, or cause new records to be created. Uh, I should cabin that and say that there are actually several ways to get information from the phone company. One of them involves calling up the company and talking to their lawyers. Um, but uh, there was a, a really stellar story written by the Washington Post's uh, Craig Timber a few months ago about an Israeli company uh, called Berent. Uh, and they basically take advantage of the roaming agreements between the international cell phone companies uh, and, and such that any one phone company that's part of this like, global conglomerate of, of phone agreement uh, or providers who sign these agreements can query another phone company's database without going through the legal team. And so this very company has basically built surveillance as a service where you can log in through their website and obtain cell phone tower location data about someone in a different country without going through the appropriate legal process. It's really just staggering uh, revelation. It takes advantage of uh, security vulnerabilities in the network and, and the fact that these parties all trust each other. All the phone companies trust each other. Well, they have to. They have to, yeah. Right. For you to be able to you know, land at Dulles Airport with a Swiss phone and immediately turn it on and start making and receiving calls, there needs to be an exchange of information between the parties. AT&T needs to be able to verify that you are indeed 
a currently dues paying member of Swisstel uh, so they can pass on those charges. And um, you know, so you only need one phone company to make a deal with a surveillance vendor. Uh, and that can be you know, an Israeli phone company, it can be a Kenyan phone company. I mean, it's really the weakest link in the chain. Uh, and, and so we have you know, these sort of surveillance services that access data from the phone company databases themselves. We have the phone companies turning over stuff with their knowledge and consent. Uh, and then separately, law enforcement agencies or intelligence agencies can go out and directly acquire the information themselves. And uh, the most high profile examples of that include uh, devices with uh, fun names like the Stingray and the Dirtbox. Um, you know, at a high level, what these are are um, technological devices that exploit security flaws in the underlying cell phone network to allow people to, to basically pick signals out of the air or in some cases force phones nearby into identifying themselves. Um, Angela Merkel's cell phone calls have apparently been picked up using uh, a dirt box installed at the US Embassy. Uh, if you, those of you who've looked through uh, the Snowden slides and seen uh, this organization, uh, the, sorry, I'm, I'm even blanking on it. Marcia, what's the name of the, uh, the embassy based snooping up that you know? I'm blanking um, on it too. Whatever it's called, at most U.S. embassies, there's a special NSA yes. unit that does close access operations, and one of the things they do is they have um, they have these antennas on the roof uh, that, uh, that collect information, and so the dirt box is, is providing that. And so, regardless of how they do it, whether the government is acquiring it themselves, going through the phone company, um, or in essence hacking into the phone company's database, uh, the information that they get is extremely accurate. It's invasive. It, um, it reveals not only where you are, but who you're near. Uh, and many of these technologies, technologies by their very design, uh, are overbroad in that they don't just collect information about one person, but they collect information about vast numbers of people. And you know, I'll leave it to Marcy to get into the legal weeds on this. But you know, one big problem that we have is that we feel like the moment the government collects it, a problem has occurred. And I think in the government's eyes, uh, as long as they have some kind of post-acquisition minimization of this information. Everything's fine, uh, and you know there there is some language in the pen register statute and other statutes, you know, about all technically available means. Um, but I think the government is probably pushing really, really, really far in that, and uh, and is collecting vast amounts of information on innocent people because they say, well, this is the only way we have to collect it. We, there's no way that we can collect it about just this one person, so we're going to get get it on everyone and then figure out the details later. Right, and one thing I would just say is that it is unclear how often this type of surveillance is done in a targeted basis and how often on a bulk basis. So like there's when you when they go to the phone company, it's often for an individual record, correct? But when you fly in a plane But what do you mean by an individual record? Well, I believe they have to go with at least somebody's I mean, identifying I, details. I, I think what right? Julie is asking is like if they're looking for one person if they go to the phone company, they can say, give us John, give us, give us John Smith's telephone tell records, mm -hmm. or like where he is now, where he was last week. Mm -hmm. But with a dirt box, there is actually no way. The, the way the device works, it, collects it's, everything. it only collects information about everyone using that ca that carrier. The, the best they can do is focus on a particular phone company. So if they know that the target's using Sprint, they don't have to, they don't have to masquerade as, as AT&T. But if they don't even know which uh, phone company the target's using, they'll collect everything about everyone. And you know, it's for that reason that um, you know, just this morning we learned that Senator Tester and 10 other senators sent a letter off uh, to the uh, Attorney General and, and Secretary of DHS asking letters. And, and it really, if you read the letters that these senators sent and the ones that Markey and Franken sent before, it really seems like what, what's concerning them isn't the information about the bad guy that the government's looking for, because typically when the marshals who, who are using these dirt boxes, uh, when the marshals are are looking for someone, you know, in many cases, there's an active arrest warrant for them, right. someone who's, you know, escaping uh, or on the run from the law. The concern here is that in looking for that needle in the haystack, you know, we are the haystack and, all, and our information is, is, right. is being obtained, you know, and it's one thing when they drive a van through a neighborhood and they get information about 100 phones or 1,000 phones, but when they're driving or they're flying this plane over a whole city, uh, we're talking about tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, who will never learn that they were the subject of surveillance, whose information might be kept in a database for you know, God knows how long, uh, and, and whose privacy is invaded um, simply because they happen to have their phone turned on when the government was flying a plane over their house. Right. And just to be clear, the story, in case you guys don't know about the plane, the, there was an article about the marshals 
um, using the dirt box in planes. So basically, they load them up in a low flying plane and fly around the area where they're looking for this person and scoop up all the cell signals. And so we do know that at least in that case, that's a pretty bulky collection. Right. <laughs> and we, we would be mistaken, I think, in assuming that it's not also being added to drones. Oh no, for sure, it's definitely. Right. And so we know for for a certain for certain that this is being used in the intelligence community, and that these devices are being put on drones. And so um, uh, the first look uh, had a story this spring. It was Greenwald mm -hmm. and uh, um, I forget who the other reporter on the story was. Scahill, wasn't Scahill, it? Scahill, yeah. They had a story uh, about this, and uh, the, the classified name of the program was different. It didn't have Stingray in its title, but you. You know, you read the story, and it talks about cell site simulators, so cell site simulators being put on the undersides of drones, and fl being flown over Yemen to get records of every uh, cell phone or Wi-Fi access point uh, in the country. I mean, in in that case, I mean, it's really, it, it's basically the Google Street View vans, except in a drone flying over a city where, you know, or a country where we're at war. Right, and so the thing is that about what's interesting about the location. Oh, sorry, it's called Gilgamesh. That's the name of the program. Although, though, I would add though that I mean, since I think three or four years ago, um, the Air Force came out with their rules on retention of U.S. person data collected on training runs of drones, um, and one of the big training bases for drones in the United States is right on one of the main drug lines coming out of Mexico. And so they can collect whatever they want from those training runs, and as long as they weren't targeting anyone, it's there. It's in a database somewhere. Oh, wow. Um, so the, one of the questions, just to broadly frame it, and then I'm going to come to Marcy for the legal stuff, is basically that location tracking, when it's described often, is often described as like, we're looking for this one bad guy, and don't you want us to be able to chase a him or her in their location with their phone? And in fact, you know, I at least feel like we do. If somebody <laughs> was um, criminal and did something bad to my children, I would definitely want that to happen, right? But we, one of the questions, just like with all the surveillance, like with NSA, with the phone dragnet, we don't know how often um, these really bulky methods are being used and what happens to the data afterwards. So, and then there's the question of the legal regimes under which this is done. So I was hoping Marcy can give us a little sense of the legal landscape under which location tracking is conducted. Well, and I, and I think one of the interesting questions is who's doing it, because a lot of these technologies come in through the DEA, which has a, is, you know, has a, from the time of Reagan, has sort of operated under the same rules you'd expect in foreign intelligence, even though it's actually criminal procedure, and they get away with that for who knows what reason. Um, but so uh, one of, so DEA is going to use it and maybe operating first in Mexico and then it leaches into the United States. Um, one of the big numbers is the marshals. And yeah, we'd, we'd like to see the marshals go chase down fugitives. That's one of the applications where this makes sense, except that we know the marshals and the FBI are going to local law enforcement and saying, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll set up a stingray for you, don't tell. Um, and one of the questions, I, one of the suspicions I have, and this is just a suspicion, is that one of the things they're doing by doing that, by the, the FBI and the marshals, is basically setting up this, this nationwide network that they can tap into at any time that is, you know, meant to be local law enforcement chasing down uh, local drug dealers um, and in fact is gives them coverage across the United States so they never, they don't have to go to the telecoms. Um, and that's just a theory, but so you've got the yeah, DEA. But, but what you're describing there, it's actually not that, it's not that crazy, right? So when we learned last month that the police in Norfolk, Virginia had right. established this cell phone program where every time they seize a phone or every time they submit a pen register and get records of, of who people have called, all that information is dumped into a single database and, and three or four law enforcement agencies in this region are all pooling information so that they then have it for future investigations. And so, you know, what we're told is this is the first time this has happened in the state of Virginia, but, you know, it, you can understand why they would want to do this, right? So, they you know, being... Law enforcement, yeah. and, and the, the reason is, you know, I, I think, particularly in the after the last year and a half, two years, you know, you open up the newspaper and you read about these surveillance programs, and you have these NSA officials talking about how useful they are for catching these bad guys, and you know, so the local police are saying, well, hang on, we want these big data tools as well, and you have companies like Palantir who are going around and talking about the power of big data for surveillance, 
Well, if you want to use big data tools, you got to have big data. And if, law, if local law enforcement don't have the authority to compel the disclosure of big data, well, how else are they going to get it? And so I think that's why we're seeing the police in Tidewater, Virginia, trying to create their own large databases because they want to use the same tools. They want to they want to use the same kinds of techniques to catch bad guys and do like two or three hop analysis, but they're not able to go to AT and T and say, "Give us every record of every single person in the country." So they got to make do with what they have. And I think retention, uh, you know, it makes sense for them because like if they have this data passing through their hands, why get rid of it? Right, and by pooling resources, I mean, and that one was was invented. The idea came from the U.S. Attorney's Office. They said, hey, why don't you pool together? Um, you'll be able to get licenses. You'll be able to pull your data, and all of a sudden, your big data. And, and I mean, again, one of the reasons why I suspect that there's this kind of mutual reinforcement going on is because that gives national entities this kind of national coverage, um, but it also gives the local, the, the local cops fun tools. And it turns them into, you know, and I mean, since 9-11, we've been seeing this notion on data sharing and everything has shifted. I mean, even I think authorities have shifted from NSA to FBI. And once you shift to FBI, the rules on data sharing are much looser. And so whereas NSA can't give phone records to the local cops, the FBI can. And so if the data comes into the FBI first and foremost, then it's, I think, a lot easier to share it down to the local cop for a you know, street protest. Um, and so I think historically you see this coming out of DEA. You see it coming since 9-11 and even before, but especially since 9-11, you see it coming out of counterterrorism. And we're seeing these authorities leach down and onto the local levels. And we're, I mean, we are going, we have seen, and we are going to see a lot more protests, a lot more First Amendment stuff being surveilled by location data. And you know, you, you see these reports. There was a report that may or may not be true coming out of Chicago recently that they were using stingrays on some of the um, post-Ferguson uh, protests. Um, and, and that's where you get in, as Chris was talking about, the cops can do it on their own. If they get a stingray, they can just go out and do it. And then, and, and there's what, one case? where location has actually made it into a criminal case? It, there's very few, and what's actually been really surprising is that in the in the now two or three cases I know of where defendants have learned that they were the subject of a, 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 sing, a stingray investigation, um, when their defense lawyers, or the, when they themselves, uh, when okay. they've been representing themselves, uh, when they've pushed, they've, uh, they've been able to get a very, very good deal from the government. We just we were talking to one lawyer in, in Baltimore who was his client got off with six months of probation this week because he was looking at 10 years. Uh, and because the government really, really wants to keep this technology secret. Well, what's interesting about sort of the legal landscape is that, at least on the law enforcement level, there seems to have been, um, there's, I think, a concern about setting precedent, right? And so, you know, starting in 2005, when the first magistrate judge turned down um, an order from... Um, a request for cell site sur cell location surveillance. So this was in uh, Texas. This judge, um, Stephen Smith, um, got a, a request to do real-time cell phone location tracking of a suspect. And it was under, um, it wasn't a search warrant, it was something called a D order, 2703D order, which is... It was a hybrid order, wasn't it? It was a hybrid order. Mm -hmm. So basically, it was, in his words, a novel legal theory is probably the best way to describe it. So the government was arguing that if you took two different parts of the Electronic Communications Privacy Act and like merged them together, it created like the legal authority for uh, real-time cell phone surveillance tracking, and he questioned that legal authority. And since then, interestingly, for the past, I think it's almost 10 years now, right, because we're <laughs> like 2005, magistrate judges across the country have been turning down these orders, using Smith's precedent and building on it. And so it's gotten harder for law enforcement. It depends basically on the jurisdiction. It's really kind of bizarre. Right now there's a circuit split between the Fifth Circuit and the Eleventh Circuit, actually, on whether you can do um, cell site surveil cell surveillance without a search warrant. And so and there's a case pending right now in San Francisco. And so one thing I wonder about this is that 
you have judges kind of pushing back. And mm -hmm. so I wonder if that leads to more reliance on your own technology. So if you have a stingray, yeah. Yeah. then you don't have to worry yeah. about your judge turning you down. I suspect what has happened, because um, one of the things that we've discovered recently is that Chris was right in 2009 when um, there was an IG report on how Section 215 was being used. And they said there are these combined uses and one of the combined uses they were willing to admit to was um, you get phone records and also subscriber information. And then that was fixed with the Patriot reauthorization in 2006. But there was a lot of redaction there. And Chris in 2009 said, oh, I think it's location. And um, what it actually was was response to this opinion from Smith and a couple of the other magistrates and the language added, this is like, we didn't know this, but the Patriot Act reauthorization in, in 2006 actually did a tiny good thing because they added the subpoena language. They said you have to be able to, this, this has to be accessible to a subpoena language. And with those precedents and with the fact that judges were asking for more process for at least probable cause or something more, um, they went to the FISA court and the FISA court said, well, maybe you shouldn't, the FISA court, approved requests with these precedents and with the language passed but not in, or or just about to pass so this was february of 2006 um and i think those hybrid orders continued beyond what the government claims they should have continued so continued beyond the patriot patriotic reauthorization in march of 2006 but i'm i guarantee you that's when they started going to stingray in both in both the criminal and the FISA uh, arena that they're going to go to Stingray because then I don't know how the logic is different. And we're now being seeing magistrates push back against Stingrays. So let me, let me draw a sort of higher level observation, which I think really applies here. Which, there are many privacy advocates in this room. I think the entire audience is privacy advocates. So <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, and we like to complain that, you know, the government hasn't updated the Electronic Communications Privacy Act in a long time, that the law that we're dealing with is, you know, dates from 1986, and it's true. And we are right in saying that the laws that protect our privacy haven't been updated. But I think we should also bear in mind that the laws that permit surveillance haven't been updated in a long time either. Um, and so what that means then is that when a new surveillance technology comes online, when it either is created or it trickles down from the intelligence community down to law enforcement, law enforcement have to use the same old rules that they've always had. They don't get, they don't go to Congress and say, okay, we just bought this brand new piece of equipment. Can you please pass legislation that explicitly authorizes it? What they do instead is they shoehorn this new technology into an old series of surveillance rules um, that, that don't really work well. And so what we're seeing is sort of two things. One, law enforcement agencies and, and the lawyers who, who, who creatively help them either trying to use the existing authorities to, to say, well, Stingray is like a pen register or a Stingray should probably require a search warrant or manufacturing these, these tools by taking the base elements, you know, these various legal authorities and smushing them together and saying, well, okay, we don't really have it from this. We don't really have it from this. So let's put them together and then maybe that'll equal the authority. And of course it doesn't work very well. But, and, and, and it particularly doesn't work well as in the case of Stingray where the government more often than not, isn't telling the courts what they're actually asking to do. And so what we're seeing across the board on the Stingray front is local law enforcement agencies going to judges and asking for pen register orders that look on paper like the standard pen register orders that they get every day to go to AT&T or Verizon. And the judges are signing them thinking that what they're authorizing is a vanilla pen register. And then when information about the Stingray comes to light, then the police say, oh, no, 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 don't worry. It was all authorized by the courts, but the courts thought they were authorizing something else. And we're seeing this uh, in the case of Stingrays. We're seeing this on the, in the now emerging area of government hacking, where the search warrant applications really don't indicate to judges really what they're actually authorizing and what, they're, what the, the, the extreme powers they're Chris, don't call giving hacking. the government. Not sorry, yeah, sorry, it's remote, remote computer searches, <laughs> as the government insists. Um, we have a problem, which is that the government is, is sort of, you know, pushing these new techniques and technologies, some of which are really invasive and overbroad, through these old authorities. And you know, I think part of this is Congress's fault, which is that nothing happens here. I think it's also that 
the law enforcement community doesn't really want to tell the public what cool things they have. In this case of the Stingray, they will swear up and down that even discussing the name of the product will tell the bad guys you know, what they're doing and, and how to circumvent it. But as a country, we don't have a good way of regulating new surveillance technologies. And I think that's then creating all these other problems that manifest themselves you know, in the case of these hybrid orders or these other things. But we don't, we don't have a good way of dealing with these new technologies. Right, Although, and to put, to, to put it another way, I mean, I think, you know, we've got, these new technologies are about what we call mosaic analysis and what the intelligence community calls mosaic analysis, meaning both you're collecting so much data, but you're also chunking so many different kinds of data together to be able to pinpoint the people who Julie wants to keep away from her children, rightly so. And, and that's great. These technologies, I think, really are useful to some law enforcement applications and certainly to counterterrorism. And I think as privacy advocates, we need to acknowledge that. But the government doesn't want to admit how much mosaic analysis they're doing and, and the, the degree to which it entails collecting tons of data and then sifting through it to find the overlap of that data. And there are many reasons for that, some of which are bad. Uh, they don't want to scare average citizens. Um, they don't want to admit that some of this data analysis is not as good as they, they don't want to, they don't want to have to prove it works, right? Um, but I, but I also think, I think Chris is absolutely right that, that uh, we need to come up, we need to find a way to give law enforcement and national security the ability to do this kind of analysis in a way that is that that protects privacy as much as possible um, and imposes i mean right now what's happening is different entities are minimizing the data sometimes it's the you know sometimes no one does it the magistrates are trying to do that now and the district court judges are kind of throwing that out um, sometimes in the national security context uh, the the uh, FISA court does it. Sometimes uh, Congress is getting involved. Sometimes the agencies are doing it themselves. And as a result, I don't think, I mean, you know, John Roberts, you, I, we're not going to trust the Fourth Amendment to a bunch of agency protocols. Um, and that's SCOTUS already. That's SCOTUS law already. And so I think that that's the problem is to come up with a solution that allows these entities to do mosaic analysis in appropriate contexts prohibits it in other contexts and finds a way to limit the kind of stingray collection where millions of people's data is collected forever and ever. But, so actually, it sort of is happening a little bit on the state level. Mm -hmm. So um, some states have um, passed laws requiring search warrants for cell location surveillance. Massachusetts, New Jersey, and I think a few others. Um, Those are the states you're talking about. They're the ones where their state Supreme Court so have held that location data is protected by, by Warren Allen, argued uh, before one of them. Oh, um, But yeah, I think about maybe 10 states now have right. passed. And then there's like, I think more than a dozen, 15 states that have passed laws requiring search warrants for drone surveillance. So weirdly, there's like a, um, a grassroots kind of thing that's happening to limit um, location surveillance, right? By local law enforcement. By local law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Of course, they all have national security exceptions, and so there's not going to be, that's not going to do anything for the federal government or intelligence. It's not not that they're national security exceptions, it's just the state's current yeah, past laws right. that, that govern federal law enforcement surveillance. Right, so that's what I mean. But basically, but it is interesting that I think that that, there is something happening, right? It's not right. that nothing is happening. Um, and, and I think, loca I mean, location is one of those areas where I think the body of law is going to force the government's hand in a way that a lot of, I mean, cloud collection isn't, there. that's not happening yet. But I think location, um, partly because the ACLU is terrorizing the government on this on this front very successfully, um, that I that I think that is changing. But I think it should be an object lesson in how, from a legal standpoint, we can win some of these battles because um, because courts are are amenable to reconsidering these if you can explain the technical aspect and the legal implications, the legal risk to people. I also think that location. Is very visceral for people. I mean, these states aren't passing. These states are passing laws because it's really popular, right? People are like, I do not want a plane flying over my backyard and looking at me, right? And, it, and, it and I don't want them picking up my cell phone signal. And people really get that the way that actually I'm not sure people get about 
the NSA bulk records, right? Which well, seems more remote. And it, and it also spans the political spectrum. Right? When, I, when I go down to Texas and I testify, I have conservatives talking about the sensitivity of records revealing which gun store or pro-life rally you have gone to. And, and I mean, people really get this re regardless of their particular politics or what information they care about. I, mean, there's, I think there are private things that everyone doesn't want, their neighbors or their colleagues or, or the government. So it turns out that location is very high on that sensitive data list. So and, wanna, and it's very sensitive. Right. So my favorite, I want to tell two studies, yeah. which is the two famous studies about location data and how sensitive it is. So one study showed that 95% of people can be identi uniquely identified by just simply four locations that they visited. And um, so the, one, the four that I visited uh, are going to be different than the ones Chris, and that will only be me that would be at those four. And then there was another study, which was spectacular, from Microsoft Research, which showed that your location data is highly predictive of your future location. And it actually kind of goes like this. So Monday through Wednesday is very predictive. So wherever you are on Wednesday is most likely going to be there the next Wednesday. And those are to taper off towards the weekends because you might go away on weekends. But basically, <laughs> every Wednesday, if you get someone's location data, like you're definitely going to get them the next Wednesday. And so those are the kinds of things that are that cause people, I think, to feel very special about their location data. I was just actually in Paris this week um, at this European... Was it Wednesday? No, I, w I was flying all day Wednesday. So, um, But they were debating, um, the European Data Protection Commissioners were all having a discussion about their own privacy laws. And one thing that they, they have very strong privacy rules in Europe, not to throw, by, um, by and large. But they haven't actually added location as a sensitive data mm -hmm. piece. And they are, they were considering adding it because they have, it just historically hasn't been, they have actually a lot of things that we don't have political affiliation, um, uh, union membership, things like that, that we don't actually consider sensitive here. But um, it, it seems to me like there's something special about location that is already galvanizing people to take action on. And those are the only surveillance laws that have really come into pass for the past, 10 years, really. So I read this really good book called Dragnet Nation, where uh, she <laughs> also you. talked about location <coughs> in uh, cell phone apps. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we haven't talked about that yet. Um, how law enforcement and certainly national security can tap into the location that you happily give over to your cell phone app. I mean, they, they could, but realistically, right now, they're not. Uh, law enforcement. The NSA, I think, NSA is, is, yeah. is, is a different beast. But law enforcement <laughs> doesn't need to chase after you know, whatever third-party app you happen to install this week, because they can go to the phone company. The phone company is a reliable, trustworthy partner who will pick up the call and will provide the information. Um, you know, we, we have learned that uh, NSA and its Five Eyes partners are directly, are, are specifically looking for information inadvertently leaked by third-party apps to their advertising partners. And, and I think that's because, you know, those agencies want to, they don't want to get information about one person, they want to get information about everyone. And so any single source of data that's emanating from your phone, they want to try and get it. Uh, but to be clear, if law enforcement wants it, they're probably not going to be going to, well, to Yelp. so many options, right? I mean, law enforcement not only has cell phone um, information, but they also have um, those license plate recognition systems, right, which are tracking your location and all the police uh, vehicles are installed with these cameras that just take pictures of every car that they go by. And so there's a huge database of sort of where your car has been parked. And of well, course, you know, the connection between ALPRs and Stingrays, which we talked about before, um, which is the topic of a TED video that went online this morning, given by my ex-colleague, Catherine Crump, is that much of this technology was created for the intelligence community and military. These were technologies created for the battlefield that are being brought back to small town America largely through DHS and DOJ grants. Right? These are FEMA grants and, and other DHS grants that are paying for this technology because the <coughs> fact is law enforcement agencies don't have you know $300,000 lying around in their budget for a piece of fancy gear. They, they either get the money from DC or they raid the civil asset forfeiture fund. Um, but these technologies are coming from Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know I think for many people in the civil liberties and uh, public interest communities you know, in the last few months who've been, you know, who've really sort of woken up at the uh, shocking and disturbing images from places like Ferguson where you see, you know, a bearcat armored personnel carrier in, in a town, those images are shocking. 
but you should understand that technologies just like that are being given to law enforcement that enable surveillance. They just don't look very interesting. A <laughs> they don't sting, look scary. A stingray <laughs> looks like it, it, it look, a stingray looks like a piece of hi-fi equipment. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't look like a gun or a tank. But the same grant programs are paying for local law enforcement agencies to acquire this technology, and you know. They can only mow over so many people with a bear cat, but they can spy on every single person uh, in a town with an ALP on it. So really, we need some sort of like police militarization of surveillance equipment, like subset of the police militarization I mean, theme. Well, it's all part of the same. Uh, and I, but I also think that um, my suspicion is local cops want the bear cats because they're sexy. Um, you know, that like the, the case in Virginia where the U.S. attorney said, here, build a dragnet, um, I think is really interesting because it's not necessary, you know, you do need a certain volume and you do need a certain critical mass for that to work, whereas a bear cat, can, you can park it and you'll feel good about having it. And even if you just pull it out at the annual pumpkin parade, um, <laughs> it's still pretty good, right? Um, but I, so I, so I think, um... <laughs> but but I do. <laughs> it was a bear cat in the pumpkin parade. I'm sure everyone knows that, but I just want to be. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't exaggerating here. Right, <laughs> that was a factual thing. <laughs> um, so I guess the point I'm making, and this is just supposition, but I think that um, there's probably more pressure from the top to embrace these surveillance technologies, um, whereas I think there's more draw for the bear cat. You know, I'm going to sign up for a bear cat or I'm going to sign up for all these fun tools because they're more visceral and it's more likely your local cop is going to know how to use them. Whereas a lot of the surveillance technology, in the same way you need to teach a judge what it is or you can easily not teach a judge what it is, I think you you have to teach local law enforcement how to use it and what they can do. Um, and But I also think that that's why it's that much more prone for abuse. So the, I mean, the flip side of this, of yeah. course, is that the bear cat works whether or not it's secret. Right, like they they can break down your front door and drive into your living room, whether or not you know that they have that device. But the stingray really only works uh, if the public's kept in the dark. I mean, if you are if if you are an informed target, you can turn off your phone and the stingray doesn't work anymore. And so, I, you know, what we're seeing time and time again from law enforcement is a determined effort to keep everything about this technology secret. They are driven to an extreme degree of paranoia about this and are, like I said before, you know, cutting deals left, right, and center to avoid this stuff coming coming uh, to light. That, and that's, I think, what, what's unique about the money that's flowing from D.C. They don't need to keep you know, uh, the tanks and the AK-47s a secret, but the surveillance technology, it's very, its very functionality depends on as much secrecy as possible. And so the only thing we have in many cases from city councils are, you know, grant applications. We have, you know, a one-page document saying that we've received three hundred thousand dollars from DHS and we wish to waive the um, the the bidding rules to allow us to buy this equipment from one company. That's all we learned. There was that great case in Florida where the police had signed an NDA with the Stingray the supplier, and then the, so they said you can't actually enter as evidence because we have non-disclosure agreements that we... Not only that, they hadn't been telling judges because right. they they'd interpreted right. the non-disclosure agreement I mean they couldn't tell the courts. Right, so they basically said we can't tell the courts because we have this commercial non-disclosure agreement which just seems like a really um, interesting way to interpret Well, and the, the Baltimore law. one as well where, they, where the judge was like, you don't have a non-disclosure with me. Right. <laughs> which is how that guy got off, right? Uh, that was actually a separate case. Okay, yeah. There's uh, There are several cases in Baltimore on, on holding right now um, one of which we fire, uh, filed an amicus brief and uh, with a really cool footnote to the wire. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, because yeah. it's Baltimore. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, these things are really unfolding. And you know what's really fun for us is that as judges are learning about this technology, often by reading their newspaper, um, one, they're upset to learn, to have to learn from the newspaper what the police are doing. Uh, and two, what we're seeing is when, when they get informed, they start saying no. And, you know, just days after uh, the local newspaper in Charlotte, North Carolina, talked about this technology, uh, a first for that region, a judge said, no, I'm not going to issue a pen register order uh, approving this technology, because now the judge knew what they were actually asking to do. And so for those of us who work in this space, 
Uh, and and no, no offense to Julia, who has worked at you know some of the most important news organizations in, in the country, you know the Wall Street Journal now ProPublica, ProPublica. I think many many advocates think that if we get this major scoop, what we should do is take it to the New York Times or to the Wall Street Journal, and and that's where we're going to get impact. But I think what we're starting to learn now is that USA Today. Uh, and the news organizations that can push things into local newspapers, they're the ones that get us the impact. And, and it's, we work with local newspapers. <laughs> Your definition of local is different than flyover definition of local. But, but you know, it, it's, it's been really rewarding for us. Like the, the thing that has had the most impact from Stingrays, by, by a long shot, has been one story on the front page of the USA Today. Because that's the paper that everyone reads in, in regular America. And... Um, you know, stories in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Washington Post are great if you want congressional staffers to read them, but they're actually not great if you want regular judges to read them. And uh, I think we are learning now that the way that we get, given as you described, nothing's happening in D.C. If we want these things to, to change in state capitals around the country, we need to get stories about surveillance technology in the main newspaper in Indianapolis or, or uh, you know, Kansas City. Right. I think the thing that's interesting about this is that I'm I'm concerned that this is a moving target, right? So, um, it's black and mole, right? Because you you know once you learn about stingrays and you fight all these battles and you get judges to do it, you know, then there's a million ways to get location data, and so um, we're facing right like there's drones, there's the license plates, there's going to be facial recognition cameras everywhere. Um, your cell phone gives out all different types of signals, right? Not just to the cell phone operator, but to the Apple, to the carriers, Apple and then Google, but to your apps. And then there's the Wi-Fi signals, and then there's Bluetooth. the Bluetooth signals. And then there's the iBeacon, which is like a special Apple Bluetooth uh, excitement. So it seems like, and then they each have a different legal regime. So is there, a, like, if you think about location writ large, like what would be the optimal yeah, I was going to ask Chris, what, I mean, what is, A, what is the way, what is the way that it would be appropriate for law enforcement? And it, the, the answer is probably different both for national security, for federal investigations, and for local investigations. And, and, and what is the counter surveillance to ensure that they, because just passing the law isn't going to be good enough, they're going to invent another technology. So what's the counter surveillance to ensure that, that we keep them in that box? I mean, I think the ACLU's view on location is actually relatively simple. It's that the government should get a warrant mm -hmm. when they're obtaining information about one person, and that the government has no business obtaining information about 10,000 people at a time. Um, and I think that doesn't matter whether they're doing that via, you know, a request to AT&T, or a Stingray on an airplane, or a Bluetooth scanner driven through the streets. The government has no business doing bulk surveillance of law-abiding Americans. Um, and I think, you know, you're, you're right, Julia, that you know, it does at times seem like whack-a-mole. And, um, you know, I think the long-term path, the long-term end goal or end situation is not a particularly uplifting one on location, right? There is no privacy te technology that exists that will protect your location information from the cell tower if you are using a cell tower. Right. Um, you know, long-term, you know, this, I think, if 2013 was not, then 2014 is definitely sort of the year of ubiquitous encryption and the move towards that. Um, and, you know, we're getting to a point now where it's becoming really easy to actually protect your telephone, the contents of your calls and the contents of your text messages. I now routinely have encrypted telephone calls with, with other lawyers, uh, in my, with lawyers in my team and with journalists. And, I mean, it's, it used to be like pulling teeth, and now it's becoming habit. And it's, I mean, the shift has been really fast, and I think in part that's uh, been the result of finally the, the availability of easy-to-use encryption technology. But, you know, I think long-term, we're moving pretty pretty quickly to an era where the government's going to lose access to a lot of communications content, and they're going to be awash in metadata. They're going to have so much metadata, they're not going to know what to do. They already do. They're, and and, and, the Snowden documents, and right? the, we've seen that over and, and over. And the reason is we don't know how to hide metadata. The right. only thing we have are anonymization technologies like Tor that slow things down. And you may be willing to deal with a 30-second you know, 30 delay on an email, but you're not willing to deal with a five-second delay for a telephone call. It's just not an option. Um, and so certain kinds 
the the only anonymization technology we know about that would sort of work in some in some circumstances don't work for things like telephone poles. And so we don't know how to deal with that. And so for the foreseeable future, law enforcement are going to have call detail records. They're going to have cell tower, cell tower location records. Uh, they're going to have all of the, those sources of information, and they're going to have increasingly sophisticated data mining tools. And then on top of that, we have to deal with a rapidly approaching reality of law enforcement hacking people's devices. And it's going to trickle down from the FBI to the DEA and the marshals, and then it's going to trickle down to the LAPD and the MIPD and then to small town sheriffs. And you know, I, I don't think that many Americans or many privacy advocates are quite ready for a world in which the local police sheriff is watching your webcam. Um, because he or she has hacked in, into that. But I think that's where we're going. And, and as advocates, on one hand, you know, it's terrifying. Uh, on the other, um, the idea that the government isn't going to be able to listen to every call uh, and read every email is actually pretty pretty hopeful. That, that there is some, some hope that I see there. Even if they know who I'm talking to, I, I am at least quite happy that it's getting easier to hide the work. And I want to add, Julia, you made a point in your book that even one of the ways to try and avoid the surveillance is by going off grid, but even then they're going to pick you up on facial recognition or on, uh, I mean, they're going to, they're, they are surveilling meat space closely enough to be able to treat that as metadata just as they would your location, the other kinds of location or your, or your call metadata. One thing that, um, yeah, facial recognition, I think, is really the most it's terrifying. It's, it's terrifying because when you when you can when you lose any ability to be anonymous on the street or um, anywhere in life, it just it that's the thing I personally the most. You're a journalist. Of. I mean, right. that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's you when don't you even have lose the ability to protect right. your sources. Well, that's like you, right now you have this like it's really hard as a journalist and you can't get any of your sources to be safe, but like in theory, if you do the like meeting in the garage, like the deep throat, you know, Watergate thing, that like theoretically you could still have this face to face conversation. It's the and then when you lose that, when there's when anywhere you are in public you're instantly known, it does it feels really dystopian. I mean, it's, it's the technology that kills practical obscurity. <coughs> Right. We we have this degree of privacy that isn't there because of the law. It's there because it's too difficult and too expensive to link all these various databases. And facial recognition is a thing that ties everything together. And yeah, I think I think for for those of us who are in the weeds on this, either it's something that terrifies us or it's something that is so terrifying that we don't think about it because it's the only way that you can get through your day. But uh, facial recognition. I think will the, the availability of the technology and the databases that make it useful will I think change our society in such a a huge uh, and disruptive way. I mean I I, I don't even, I can't even think through all the ways that it's going to change things, but I know that it's going to make a lot of things worse. Well, let's go drink. No, <laughs> um, I think this might be the time. No, I do want to ask. Um, talk about the smart cookie. And how that how that turns your phone into because one of the things we know the government does is they you know on the national security side they are mapping all of these identities together and so um, and they have this is something that the FISA court has challenged them on in the past and presumably they have um, overcome the barriers the FISA court put into place in, in 2009 that, that in 2009 on all of these dragnets that they use they could go into a database and pull up the identities um, that they thought were connected and um, dragnet across all of them. They do that still under 12333 data, and there's a ton of US person data under 12333 data, so they're doing that on us anyway, but at least within the FISA content, the context, the, the courts, you know, I mean, I think the, the matching on burner phones is about 94%, is that? Matching, you, meaning, meaning, so uh, like, if, they like, can like, match it. like hemispheres ability yeah. to predict. I mean, that's the, I got that number from hemisphere. You, is that still an accurate number? I mean, I think it depends, right? Tell but, people what hemisphere. So is. hemisphere, it, it was a is a DEA and other law enforcement agency program run by AT and T, in which AT and T has I think twenty five years worth of call detail records, and they put uh, a bunch of sophisticated data mining algorithms in place to try and solve this pretty interesting, from a computer science perspective, problem of. You know, the person that you're watching 
dumps his or her phone and buys a new one, can you can you look through the call records you have of the past and, and the ones that are coming in and predict with high reliability what the new phone that person's using? And um, you know, for those of you who've seen The Wire, uh, this is actually like the Hemisphere program isn't in here, but this problem is, which is you know, you have these drug dealers, they're cycling through phones all the time, and you know, ultimately, whether you're uh, a Baltimore drug dealer or a CIA um, uh, extraordinary rendition agent in Milan, the, the undoing will be whether you are using this phone in a clean way, right? What, what undid the CIA agents in Milan was using the burner phones to call people who they called from other phones in the past, right? And that's what Hemisphere looks for. Hemisphere looks for repeat patterns, and the, 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 the sort of gem of intelligence here is even if you switch phones every day or every week, you're still sleeping in the same place, and your husband or wife or girlfriend or grandparents are keeping the same phone numbers. And so what you're looking for is people is numbers and patterns of life that, that, that leak out. If you are only using your burner from a a public place, and you're not calling anyone outside the rapidly changing burner network. My guess is it's probably really difficult to identify those people. Although, although they did get chuckled this morning. Although there are probably so few people engaging in those kinds of se severe obsec tactics that then you stick out uh, like a sort of just by doing there that. There was a case like that, the Hezbollah case. Remember, they found it was the Israeli who found. Yes, yeah, so Matthew Cole has two stories he talks about in his blackout talk. One is the CIA agents in Milan getting getting screwed because they were swapping SIM cards between the clean and dirty phones. And then the other was Hezbollah popping the CIA and Mossad oh, right. the networks the again because yeah. of burners because the Israelis assumed that Hezbollah, of course, would never get people inside the uh, the local phone network to turn over records, and they turned it over, and then they did uh, call detail mapping. But it was a burner. It was They were using burners, they were but using they weren't, um, their patterns were matchable. Right, and yeah. so it's... It, Walking into CVS and putting twenty dollars on the counter and walking out with a burner phone isn't like a magic wand that you can wave and suddenly you're never going to be identified. Although I did try it, <laughs> you, you <laughs> and have, it failed. But you have, you, you have to, <laughs> That's what I'm you have to follow this really rigorous protocol, yeah. which is a pain in the ass. Right, because I kept thinking I did this in my book as an experiment. So I got a burner phone and I just tried to keep it separate from my phone and like turn it off when I came home. But of course I always forgot. And so <laughs> eventually it just became the saddest. You're a terrible story. terrorist. Really. I'm a terrible <laughs> but, terrorist. But, but, yes. Again, I mean like if the CIA people who they're operating illegally in the country to snatch a guy off the streets, if they cannot do it Right, can anyone? Like, no one can do it. Like, <laughs> Didn't they go to special training so, camp? <laughs> so this problem though also exists on the internet. I mean, so don't you know the hotmail address, you're gonna get the same hotmail and you're gonna find them in the same roughly the same technologies, you're gonna map you know, you're gonna still talk to the same am I if that's correct. I, I mean I, I I think it's probably easier online because I mean it's certainly you don't have to spend twenty dollars for each email address, but um I think you're you have the right instinct, which is what you're, what just, you know, if you have this disposable email address and then you screw up once and you, and you, if you set up the email address through Tor and you only ever log in through Tor and then you screw up once and you log in from your home network, it's no longer an anonymous email account. And, you know, I'm going to be, no leaving, longer the I'm going gonna, gonna to be leaving this event uh, shortly and then going to the book talk for, with, for Gabrielle Coleman's book. And she'll, you know, at it, her book and that entire episode of anonymous is, you know, in many ways, like one sad OPSEC story after another of people who were relying on technology to keep them private and safe and secure, and they kept getting screwed because the technology wasn't bulletproof. In many cases, it didn't have good default settings. And so a classic, classic story that anyone who's ever used a VPN, a virtual private network, can, can immediately understand. You're sitting at your desktop with your computer, you have a bunch of browser tabs open, you're using a VPN, no one who's watching the network knows where you are, and you know if you're using Gmail, they think you're coming from the VPN. You close your laptop, you go to a different place, you open it up, it takes like three or four seconds for the VPN to come back up, but in that time, all the tabs have reestablished a network connection, suddenly you you're it. using the network raw, without protection, for just a, you know, a, a moment, the briefest moment of time, and that's long enough to get your real IP address into Google's, rec into Google's 
logs or, or other logs. And that's how Daniel David Ringmaiden, the Stingray defendant, was caught. He was using a prepaid Verizon data card with a VPN service, and he just didn't use the VPN service once. Several members of Anonymous had been using VPN services religiously, but then they failed that one time, and it's just that one time that's enough. And yeah, it's really, really tough. And you know, at least like your phone is only your phone is actually like well, smartphones are, are a different beast, but your phone only does so many things, and it's like it's just designed to make calls and to allow the government to track you. Uh, whereas your smartphone or your web browser now are designed to facilitate the collection of information by all these advertising companies. Well, and that's why, I, this is where I want to go, is I want to go to Supercookie, because I think it brings these two things. It makes this whole search easier. Which Supercookie? Oh, the Verizon at t one? Yeah, the Verizon oh, at t right. one, because right. it matches your... So tell people what it is, or I can. Yep. Um, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I don't know if everybody me, knows. Me, yeah, so, you so, do. So the gist is that there are tools that you can do on your... There are tools and apps you can download on your phone that will stop ad companies from tracking you. And uh, every ad company wants to be able to track users and, and deliver targeted ads. And if you are the ad company that can deliver ads to someone that no one else can deliver ads to, then you have a really good product. And so, and your Google card, your phone. And, and so Verizon and AT and T said, look at all these other companies that are making money off of our customers. What, how dare they? How dare Google and Yahoo make money off of our customers? We should be making money. And what they realized was that from their position of power as wireless carriers, they were able to uniquely identify their customers in a way that no one else could. And the reason for that is that Google only controls the software that runs on your phone, which is a pretty, pretty good position of power. But Verizon gets to see all the data before, it, just after it leaves your phone and before it comes in. And so what that means is, even if you've taken steps to protect the privacy of your data on your phone, Verizon gets to shoot each packet with a dart, a tracking dart, as it leaves your phone. They append a unique tracking ID to every packet or every uh, web browsing request as it goes out the door, which means nothing that you can do on that device will stop it happening because it's happening after the data leaves your phone. And so... So long as you're using their network. As you, so this doesn't happen if you're using the wireless network, you know, your, your, the Wi-Fi network of Starbucks, for example. But both companies uh, did this, and it, uh, it seems like it's motivated, one, by jealousy, which is that they want to get a piece of the advertising pie uh, so they want to be in the advertising business, and they will basically sell information to third-party advertisers to allow them to identify users. Um, it also seems like they want to get into the authentication business, so they want to compete with Google Plus and Facebook and these other companies for the online identification ecosystem. You know, sign in with Verizon is what they're envisioning, and you know, I, I had a conversation with one telecom executive in, in D.C., and they said, look, you know, if 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 PayPal can be even more sure that when a Verizon customer you know, pays for an item online that it's not a fraudulent transaction, that's something that PayPal will be happy with, that's something the merchant will be happy with, and that's something that both either the merchant and or PayPal might be willing to give Verizon two or three cents as part of that transaction for that increased level of assurance. And so you know, they, they think that they can get a piece of the fraud business, a piece of the online identity business. Uh, they're getting no money right now from anyone. This is a very, very small small program, but uh, they've put the technology out there. They've embedded this, this super tracking cookie in all outbound web requests. And more importantly, they don't even let their customers opt out. Uh, after uh, Julia did some great coverage, AT&T was shamed into saying that their pilot had, had, their come, pilot to, their pilot had come to its end. <laughs> but, it. but Verizon has stuck with their guns. And um, you know, no one has sort of written the story yet, but We've seen law enforcement agencies complaining quite loudly over the last few years about um, the lack of unique identifiers associated with cell phone traffic. We've seen uh, DOJ go to Congress and say that unnamed wireless carriers do not assign unique IP addresses to each of their customers, which means that if someone leaves you know, a threatening comment in a blog somewhere, they might not be able to trace it back to a particular customer. And so you know, Verizon's technology really provides that avenue for uh, attribution of web traffic that no one else can really do. Uh, and it's not just going to be you know, commercial parties who leverage that. It's right. certainly going right. to be uh, law enforcement and intelligence agencies, too. Right. And it seems to me, I mean, the, the, the reason that that's kind of where I was going is that super cookie brings these two problems together of identifying the unique phone and identifying your unique web traffic. And given 
the degree to which more and more people are, I mean, even if you're going through on your iPad, you're still going through on Verizon. And so that's still going to be true that those two identities are going to be linked. And that's the gold mine is when they can track, when they can connect all of your identities, then they've got, they've got your dossier. And there are in fact companies that, you know, that's their business model right, right. now. There are companies who are saying, you know, we can, we can link your off your your cell phone traffic to your web, your web browsing traffic at work. You know, if you look at a sweater uh, on Amazon's website at lunchtime from your desktop computer at work, and then you buy it that evening, well, you know, shouldn't the person, shouldn't the advertiser that, that first showed you the banner ad that led you to that sweater, shouldn't they get a piece of the action? And the only way for them to get paid is for that entire flow of your whole day's traffic across three different devices to be tracked and and, and mined. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even addressed the commercial location of the tracking industry, which is like its own burgeoning. There's multiple um, locations, probably at least every week, there's a location tracking commercial convention somewhere. So the, uh, it's a huge industry. Um, people want to track you when you're, where you walk within a store. People want to track you where you walk on the street to see if you're going to, if they can send you an ad as you go by the Starbucks, et cetera. So there's a huge... Um, ecosystem out there, which will, of course, feed into the government will be able to find a way to tap into it. But I'm wondering if we should open up for questions, because we have a pretty smart audience here, and I see an eager question in the back there. Uh, I have a question about what it is for any, any talk of traditional location tracking advertisers teaming up with, uh, because it seems to me like there could be a potential antitrust claim that they're tying their dominance in the cell phone market to an ad advantage in the tracking uh, industry. Oh, you mean like a case against Verizon? Right? Yeah, well, we're a traditional advertiser who isn't also a cell phone company would have standing to potentially pursue it from an antitrust perspective. It hasn't worked against Google yet, right? Um, well, I, I don't know what uh, it works. I mean, meaning that Google has that near monopoly or had that near monopoly, I think, in search. Mm -hmm. And in spite of a lot of complaints and the near devastation of other ad industries, nobody's been able to really chip away at Google. Although it, should Europe, be, it should be noted that um, when Google purchased DoubleClick, there was a dissenting opinion for the, for the antitrust review by uh, Pamela Jones Harbor, who was then an FTC commissioner, uh, in which she raised the issue of Google then getting its hands on um, a disturbing amount of data about of private data by individuals and. Um, she sort of said, in I think what will eventually become um, a widely cited dissent, um, she said we should be considering privacy as part of antitrust. Right, and we haven't, but we haven't yet seen. No, actually, that hasn't actually happened. But I think that's you know, one interesting legal theory that's swirling around, but hasn't been tested, is like whether you know personal data is a market and whether you can start using that in an antitrust um, way. And I we're not there yet. There hasn't been any cases like that. But I think that. Um, it is starting, I mean, personal data as a commercial thing is definitely a market, right? The companies, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, all compete to get more personal data about us. And that's what they use to, as leverage to sell advertisers on their services. Um, and so I think we may be entering a world where maybe the amassing of too much power in that, in too many realms, could be an antitrust case. But it seems like it's a little ways off because so far... There hasn't been anything successful on that front. Um, what, purple sweater, you were first, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, getting back on the facial recognition piece, uh, yeah. and as far as in the commercial world, because it's proliferating quite a bit through commercial uh, things, and I know it may be a little off topic with the government piece, but one of the things we're doing is analyzing the smart televisions. We? Who are you? Who are we? When you say yeah, you can tell. Oh, consumer reports. Okay, yes. Okay. So they, they, exposed you. Yeah. We just have to know that you were together. Yeah, I've already been tracked. <laughs> the, the, so one of the things is with the smart televisions that are using mm -hmm. facial recognitions, as and that seems to be starting to get accepted. And I mean, we, we rail against in the government parts, but it seems to be really moving that direction in voice recognition. Yeah. Uh, and and we're, one of the things we're trying to do is find out what, where is that data going? comes out, you know, and, and yeah. but, it, but it's being hidden really well. I mean, I, I think this, I'm going to sort of answer a different question uh, a little bit, but what, what terrifies me about these smart TVs 
uh, is that you have a device in your living room with a camera pointing at your sofa where, <laughs> where things happen on occasion uh, between consenting adults. That, that, that Tell us more, please. Yeah. Uh, and, and the device that is powering this web enabled camera never gets security updates. You have this, like, you know, you buy a TV, the lifetime of the TV is maybe like five to seven years. And, you know, maybe you'll get updates once for the lifetime of this device. And, you know, the Internet of Things is this buzzword that you hear nonstop in the city, even though many people don't really know what a thing is. Um, but, you know, the Internet of Things in this context is an Internet of no security updates. And, I, you know, it's one thing if your Internet-enabled toaster doesn't get security updates, but a, a device that has a webcam and a microphone needs to have updates. And a device that has a webcam and a microphone that's pointed at your sofa or pointed at your bed, which is when people watch TV from bed. Uh, so that means the camera's pointing at that bed. I mean, I, I think it's it's a terrifying future. And the business model of smart TVs just isn't set up for, for automatic updates. Like, how, much, how much engineering time do you expect from you know, a TV manufacturer? I, I just bought a 50 inch TV on Black Friday for $200. I mean, there's no, there's no money in that. Yeah, there's no margin. And, and there's, no, there's not enough margin to support five years worth of updates. And so I think the only thing that consumers really should be doing there is not buying devices with webcams. I think it's completely irresponsible to sell a, a consumer electronics device with a webcam uh, that is not going to get updates. And most of these things are, are not, not getting updates. Like baby monitors and, and Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I think. Cars too. You know, I'm I'm not discounting the utility of having, uh, you know, uh, a hands-free mic installed in your car, uh, or having, you know, a hands-free mic installed, you know, in your house or in your home monitoring system. But if the business model isn't aligned such as that you're going to get these updates, then I really think it makes sense to decouple the surveillance technology from the entertainment product, right? right? And so it's not a theoretical threat because there are these rings of criminal hackers who have you know distributed and share free software amongst themselves that will hack remotely your webcam and film you and then it's been used to extort people um, over nude photos and so it's not actually a theoretical threat no. at all and so either you do what julia does and you put a sticker over your webcam actually a little magnetic, a little magnetic thing slide. it slides over to reveal so, the so webcam you, you do that or you, you or you do what, I, what i've done which is, you know, I, I bought a laptop with no webcam, and then I have a, a USB webcam that I plug in when I actually need to have that, that conference call. You know, unfortunately, what terrifies me, and I suspect terrifies Julia, is there's no easy hack, no sticker or magnetic strip hack from the microphone. No. Right? The Intel people that I occasionally talk to will only smile at me when I ask about microphones. Um, you know, there's no visual indicator there that's reliable. Uh, you know, the paranoid people that I know have cut the wire to the mic in their laptops. And, you know, I, I look forward to the day that I can buy a laptop without a microphone built in. But right now it's it's there. And I think uh, I think it should bother all of us, particularly, you know, those of us in the city where, frankly, you know, what's happening in our offices that's sensitive is not going to be not going to show up on the webcam. It's going to show up on the microphone. So to follow up to that, yeah. I, I, you covered some of it. I'm also from the Agile Networks. Um, and because uh, I was going to sort of talk about the, the Internet of Things, but someone mentioned, you know, how Google bought DoubleClick. I mean, that was when you were thinking about antitrust. But I read when Google bought Nest that never mind even a webcam or a mic, they can tell through the um, thermometers and all this probably how many people are at home or if anybody's at home and so on. So as all these things become connected and, and everything gets sensors and everything is speaking to each other, I don't know where, so even if you didn't have your cell phone on, and obviously the biggest thing is cell phones, that's the, the biggest problem. But if you get, as you said, facial recognition, or if you get an internet of things where every appliance is talking to each other so you can kind of tell who's home or how many people home, and then what is the government hacking to that? Have you looked a little bit more, I don't know what you just said, Chris, or, or any of the other two of you have got about where that kind of, commercial advertising might also get in with the government surveillance? I mean, I, I think, you know, as these devices make our way their way into our homes, the companies that sell them are going to start receiving law enforcement requests. It's just, it should be expected. There's a, there's a move, there's a line from the movie Field of Dreams, you know, that cheesy Kevin Costner film, which is if you build it, they will come. And 
you know, I, I had a conversation a couple of years ago, with, you know, a few blocks away from here with a lawyer who represented a company that makes home monitoring systems. And his clients had been approached by a law enforcement agency because home monitoring systems have built-in microphones. Right? And so the question is, like, as a consumer, I want that microphone to work the moment I press the panic button. What I don't want is for that mic to be on when I haven't pressed the panic button. Um, you know, I'm very, very comfortable having a GPS over my phone that transmits my location information to law enforcement when I call 911. What I've been bothered about, about is the fact that law enforcement can covertly ping my phone's location and use that GPS functionality whenever they want with the phone company's assistance um, without my knowledge or consent. Have we ever seen any um, law enforcement orders for cars? So there's a big case from California from about six years ago called The Company, and it was a competitor of OnStar. Right, yeah. And this was a case from Las Vegas. Uh, these two mafiosos were talking in their car, and they weren't talking on the phone. And the police went to, or the FBI went to the, the in-car satellite navigation system company and said, we would like you to remotely enable the microphone in your vehicle. Um, and the company didn't want to. And the FBI went to the to the appellate courts, and the, the sort of conclusion of that case was, in that particular case, the company won, because if the FBI was listening to the microphone using the one phone line that the device had, then if you had a crash, you couldn't call 911. Mm -hmm. And so what the court said That's was... pretty narrow. So, yeah, so, so, the court, so, 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 so the court said that... So the, the government had a warrant. They had a wiretap okay. order. And so it was, this wasn't about when can they wiretap you. It's about when can they force a company that has built a device that you use to, to basically subvert the, that device security to, to secretly monitor you. And what the, the court said there was, if the surveillance disrupts the primary function of the service, then they can't ask the company to do it. But if the surveillance can coexist with the primary function of the service, then everything's fine. And so had that company been able to covertly enable the microphone while still letting you make emergency calls, then it would have been fine. And there's a technology solution that, would, that the law enforcement would be, uh, yeah. the court would have been happy with. And I think and everyone court. should be terrified <coughs> at the idea that our privacy rights rest on a particular implementation of technology in a particular device in a particular car at, a, at any given point in time. Um, you, it looks like you have something to add on this point. I, I, I did. The talk about cameras and, and mics and the access to them reminded me of was a, a tweet I sent out. It was like over a year ago that Verizon had filed this patent uh, to target advertise, a targeted advertising method that would determine if viewers are laughing, cuddling, sleeping, etc., based on access to mics and, and, and cameras. So you can imagine. On the uh, television or just anywhere? And... Um, I think it might have been specified in television, but you know, Connect, Microsoft's Connect was another um, example right. right, of that, where you have a mic and a, and a camera, and they were going to use the information from that to target advertisers. So imagine a couple in a fight, then all of a sudden they're on TV, they would get targeted at about couple counseling or something to that effect, right? Diagra. And so, <laughs> and so you, you can imagine, like, you know, this is in the advertising realm where they would start collecting more data in this realm for the basis of behavior advertising, targeting ad advertising um, in the future, and obviously, you know, concern there about the access to that information later on by law enforcement. I just wanted to kind of... I mean, I mean that's the implication, right? That's what you see is like when, when advertising goes into a realm and starts collecting data, then you fought right behind them as law enforcement trying to get access to that data. And so I just, it may be, it reminded me of that and I thought it was an interesting, <laughs> interesting thing to be aware of that, right. you know, they're looking at you, utilizing right. the mics and cameras that are in you know, right. the devices. But you, but you can understand even a, an obvious commercial reason for this, right? So, you know, you have a smart TV, you're sitting in front of the sofa, you're watching TV, it's a commercial break, you get up and go to the bathroom, or you get up and go get popcorn. The advertiser wants to know if anyone is watching their ad. If there is movement and, and the camera can detect that there's no longer a person sitting on that sofa, they might want to know that so they don't pay as much money for the advertising. And, I mean, that's like a really, really easy use case to manage. You don't need to know anything about that person. Now, if you, if you can learn about that person, if you can differentiate between you know, the adults in the house and the teenagers in the house or you know, which individual people and which profile and, and, and who they are, then maybe you can even influence the ads that are being displayed. But, you know, it, it's obvious that there are commercial interests driving the deployment of this technology. Because you have to make TV advertisement as lucrative as internet advertising has gotten because you can measure it in much 
I mean, shit, we just had this week DirecTV and CBS conclude their latest fight in which DirecTV agreed to disable the TV skipping technology they've had in their, in their devices as a condition of getting CBS's programming back. I mean, you know, the, the content companies and their ad dollars are driving the tech that's in people's living rooms. Mm -hmm. And I think it's not just about whether you could skip commercials. If, if surveillance technology can enable the delivery of higher paying ads, then we should expect them to deploy that eventually once it becomes cheap enough. And what could that be? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's also worth pointing out that I um, I always try to err on the less paranoid side of things, although obviously it's not so successful. <laughs> but, but says, says, says the woman with a container that blocks all the electrical signals to her cell phone. Yes, right. But I still, I try to be evidence-based. And so, there is definitely a lot of this stuff has very good commercial. Like, there's reasons you could imagine why companies would want to do it, and it seems sort of benign, right? And the ads that follow you around on the internet are a really good example of that. Like, they largely seem benign. Um, it's annoying and it seems weird. But one thing that I was surprised about in the Snowden documents was that the NSA has tried to piggyback successfully. successfully on that targeting, right? right? So what, and I had really resisted being the sort of conspiracy theorist about like that type of ad tracking. You know, I recognized that there were definitely situations I wrote about in my book where a woman was outed um, to her colleagues who saw that on her, on her web page, you know, there were a bunch of ads for gay and lesbian cruises. So I definitely recognize there are downsides to that kind of tracking. But I honestly hadn't thought that the NSA was already in it. And I think the problem is that when you really think about surveillance technologies and things like webcams and TVs, um, the NSA sees those as vulnerabilities that they can exploit. So well, essentially... Well, they, well, they see them as a source of data. A source of data, right. And, and so and what you end up with is that all these things have may well have and probably do have a dark side. Well, well, the other thing is, and you pointed this out in your book, is you know, those ad tracking companies often screw up badly. Like, for some reason, Mitt Romney has convinced the Republican Party and a bunch of advertisers that my mother and I are the same person, which means I get no end of pantyhose catalogs. And, and that's fine. I laugh at the money they're spending. But the notion that then that might become a data point in a dossier about me and an attempt, you know, I guess yeah. that's fun too. I mean, like uh, one of the first uses of Section 215, which is the the same authority that they use for the phone dragnet, in 2009 when uh, Najib Zazi was driving across the country, the guy who was going to bomb the subway in New York, um, they appear to have done two things. They were tracking him. They did do the phone dragnet to find his associates. Presumably, they the internet dragnet was about three weeks away from being shut down because it was violating all of FISA's orders. Um, but presumably they got a read of his internet traffic as well. But they also went to the beauty supply stores in Aurora, Colorado, and collected all of the people who had been buying TATP precursors. Uh, so acetone and hydrogen peroxide, which are very common chemicals. And they appear to have mapped that. Now that we know about the phone dragnet, they appear to have mapped that against Zazi's uh, communications network and he ca they called them these are his associates and these associates of his bought hydrogen peroxide and acetone and as far as we can tell they they in a in a um, detention document in court in Brooklyn they said there were three associates who bought more of these materials and one of them probably was his aunt but the other two were almost certainly false positives so people who were two degrees away from Najib Zazi buying completely innocent pro products, having the FBI knocking down on their door, probably Muslims, um, saying, you know, what kind of ties do you have to Pakistani terrorists? And 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 so the very one of the very first success stories of Section 215 that we have of mapping these multiple data points probably involved at least two false positives. And you know we have no idea. Like, there's not a really good way of collecting what happens to all these false positives and, and how much their lives get screwed up when the FBI asks their employer whether they're terrorists. Right. So one of the things I always say about my data is, because I went through my book, I tried to get my data from as many sources as possible. So I went to all, every data broker and asked for my files. And what I found was that some of them were wildly accurate and some of them were wildly inaccurate. 
And then I actually couldn't decide which I was more upset about <laughs> because, you know, the wildly inaccurate stuff could be really used against me in ways one company, which was an alternative credit scoring company, um, says that their data is used, for instance, at charity hospitals to determine your ability to pay. And they decided that I was a, you know, unemployed, <laughs> low income, not educated well, are, single you're, mother. You're a reporter. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> And, you know, You're saying I, that's not accurate. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying that it's not accurate. And so I, and I was upset about the idea that, like, somehow I'd land in some hospital and someone who would, like, think that I, you know, was some deadbeat. And, um, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen, but that the truth is that data was almost as concerning to me as the wildly accurate um, six years of records that Google had about every search I'd done for every second of the day <laughs> until I stopped using Google search. Um, before we wrap this up, Alan, did you have a question as well? Both of you? We can do both. I, can do both. I, I just had, so I wanted to take, I wanted to play devil's advocate for just a second since we're like mostly privacy advocates. <laughs> I wanted to go back for just a minute to the, to the issue of ALPRs, cell phone data, and just in general, like big data for law enforcement. So it could be state and locals, and obviously the feds, obviously intelligence community uses it, but focus on law enforcement for a minute. So, Assume, like, when we in the advocacy community talk to reporters, talk to judges at hearings, talk to people, you know, in generally throughout America, I mean, most people don't want to make police jobs harder for the most part, right? Or at least don't want to be perceived to be making police police's <laughs> job harder um, in most cases, right? So the question is, so police want big data tools. And everyone wants big data tools. Everyone wants more big data. This is why the Virginia you know, police, no doubt, are trying to are agreeing to pool their data. The question, sort of, that I have is, you know, can can we have it? Is there any way where we can have it both ways, where we can have um, meaningful privacy restrictions that can comport with those tools, or is it just that are are we saying on some level that law enforcement that can't have big data tools? Because, for example, it requires bulk collection. I mean, I, I think it, it's not an unreasonable position to say that there are going to be tools that are only available to the intelligence community. And I think it's unreasonable to say that <coughs> techniques and technologies that are you know, designed for the military and used in war zones are not appropriate uh, in small town America or big city America. Um, we have different, we have completely different sets of, of legal rules for surveillance in the law enforcement and intelligence context because. <laughs> You know, we un because the people who passed those laws decided that you know there was a special there were special circumstances of intelligence collection. Um, you know, Although I, 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 I would I, say, I mean, I I think that we have a problem because the drug war treats itself as an intelligence collection, and therefore um, the the ca the use case that a local cop is going to bring up is the drug war always, mm -hmm. um, and that's what's driving it. And and unfortunately, those authorities are are hidden, I mean, DEA doesn't show its work very well, and and that's a problem. Um, so sorry, I just wanted to draw Yeah, that. I mean, I, I, I guess, you know, it depends where you are, and it depends who you're talking to. I actually, you know, reject the idea that, that we, we can't say that we don't want to make life more difficult for law enforcement, because mm -hmm. the founding fathers were quite happy to do that in passing the Fourth Amendment. We just have to be delicate about how we frame that and talk about, you know, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson in that same sentence. Um, but, you know, encryption makes life more difficult for law enforcement, and, you know, many of us are involved in efforts to pressure people to use encryption technology either because we're funding it, thank you, uh, or because we are, you know, asking people to use it. But it also makes life more difficult for, for crooks, and I don't think we tell that part of the story often enough, you know, that, that uh, Apple encrypting their phone, there are like 1.3 million people who lose their phone every year. And that encryption of your phone should bring down the value of a stolen phone more quickly than anything else. Well, it, make, it makes identity theft more difficult, and other right. other forms of encryption technology, not disk encryption, but other other technologies in the device are making it so that uh, a stolen device can no longer be resold. I think it's also worth pointing out that it is not at all proven that big data is making our job any easier, mm -hmm. right? So that actually is where I would go with that question, which is. The Snowden documents show over and over again the intelligence agency with the smartest minds of our mathematical, you know, field 
are overwhelmed by this data. They're fi not finding the needles in the haystack. They're just, um, in fact, every single terrorist event that has occurred, right, there were, was data in there that wasn't adequately drawn out. And so it doesn't Including the marathon attack. I mean, right. that, that story hasn't so, been told that NSA had stuff on both the Sarnaya brothers that didn't get looked at until after the attack. So I feel like the thing, that really the question to ask is not so much do we want to make their jobs harder, but does big data work? I don't think it's actually proven in the commercial or the governmental realm. I, although, let me say, I think that's a really dangerous position to take because the technology will get better. I think saying, oh, this technology is so inefficient, it you know, naturally is going to create all these false positives and then all these innocent people are going to be roped in. I think that's really, really dangerous because it will get better. I think, you know, that's, I mean, it, it's been the position of civil society advocates for years that biometric uh, stuff was a really bad idea because of all the false positives. And then, then the false positive rate just goes down over time. And then we're, then we're when, we, when they actually do have reliable facial recognition technology, our main, you know, defense against it, that it didn't work, now is out of the window and we're, and we're stuck with the government having these facial recognition databases that do work. Okay, but the, but that's also that is, that's also why I said that I think in the privacy community we have to acknowledge that there is there is a purpose um, for mosaic collection, but we need to have a discussion about where it's appropriate and what the limits are and what the privacy what acceptable and unacceptable privacy trade offs are because until we get them to convince to admit I mean they haven't admitted that on the phone dragnet yet right and just, and just because they're going to do it doesn't mean we need to make it. Did you want to do something? Yeah, question? I actually want to push Chris a little bit on something he said earlier about how we need secrecy. Um, because we need secrecy. Well, he said it, it's a very important for surveillance tools or location tracking tools saying to be secret. I'm just saying that they um, only work because they secret. will not work if they're not secret. But then we found out later that Julia is a really bad terrorist. And even trying to bypass the location <laughs> tracking tools, she couldn't do it because there were things that she just wasn't able to keep up with. And even knowing that they were there, even with them not being secret, or her trying to bypass these figurative ones that she assumed weren't secret, she wasn't able to get around them. Is there a level of transparency that you can have, even with location tracking tools, and should have, and what is that level? So you're right, Julie is a bad terrorist. Uh, <laughs> and, and she should be fired from the, the, the International Society of Criminal Mastermind Terrorists. Um, no, I mean, I, I think the reason that Julie is sloppy, one, is because she's a human. Uh, and two is because she doesn't actually have a real, she like she's not facing time in jail. The criminals are lazy. Just so, so here's the thing. Can we, can we talk about the, like Ferguson protesters though, who have been informed like quite frequently, and I talk, have talked to them personally that fire like fire chat is really dangerous for them to use, and that all of the, their chats are are being scooped up, and that they're like this is a tool we're using. It will allow us to talk even when when the networks go down. We know where it's being it's being scooped up, and we don't care. And so they're aware of the dangers, and even though it's it's right. not as also by the way, I just want to say happen. the academic studies show that surveillance is actually most effective when it's known. So weirdly, like in terms of changing, it depends on what your goal is, but for changing human behavior, actually known surveillance by other humans is the most effective strategy. Like. If there's a social norm social that, weird. you know, Absolutely. you yeah. shouldn't behave a certain way and you know that other people are looking at you, that is the most effective form of surveillance known to mankind. So look, and then you ratchet up, and as it gets more impersonal, it causes more anxiety and less behavior change. So let me let me give a counterexample, and it's weird for me to be taking like the law enforcement position here, but um, <laughs> there are a number of features in U.S. currency or currencies around the world that uh, are there to make it difficult to, to counterfeit. And some of those features are known. Some of those features are not publicly discussed. Some of the features are put in, are described in detail to merchants so that they can, like, you know, run a pen over the currency and see that it lights up in a different color, or they can. There are things that they can look for. Some of those features are just told to the companies that manufacture scanners and printers so that they can create algorithmic technologies to look for and not print out exact duplicates of currency. And then some of those things are kept really, really tightly within the law enforcement community so that the Secret Service has a way of saying, aha, this is a really high quality North Korean copy of a hundred dollar bill, and this is, you know, a, a, a not so great copy. If every single security mechanism within the hundred dollar bill is described and known to the world, then the highly sophisticated adversary can defeat them. Now, I think that 90% of the criminals out there are not that smart. If they were smart, they would probably be 
doing better things like being bankers, um, or at least more profitable <laughs> things. Um, so still crude. <laughs> I, was so, uh, I, was, I was just baiting uh, Marcy there. Um, but, but, you know, look, look, so I, I think the question is like, what what criminals are we talking about? And I think, you know, the issue gets blurred in the public debate because law enforcement talks about that one percent bad guy who is willing to put vast amounts of time and resources into keeping you know off the grid and hiding everything he or she is doing, when in fact the vast majority of their resources are spent on people. Who are idiots, and I think that the classic sort of counterpoint to my own argument here is we've had decades of Hollywood movies and TV shows featuring wiretapping. People still talk on the phone. <laughs> like, how many Sopranos episodes have to feature wiretaps for people to stop talking and saying dumb things on the phone? But they still do it. On the other hand, there are certainly people who don't talk on phones because they've seen it on TV. And the question is, like, you know, how much? I mean, on one hand, you get Talking about wiretapping, talking about the capabilities of the wiretapping, talking about how much it costs, how it works, and what the legal rules are, that helps to keep this highly invasive surveillance method in check. And I mean, surveillance features and powers erode democracy. So we need to have some robust debate over this. We haven't had that in the case of stingrays. We haven't had that in the case of government hacking. On the other hand, when you do talk about that, the really, really smart bad guy may take no and take countermeasures and the question is is the is the loss of getting that really sophisticated actor worth it to keep our democracy robust and healthy and I think the answer is yes um, but I I won't disagree with the government that you know super secret high-tech surveillance technologies are more effective when no one knows how it works somewhere in the NSA somebody's going I'm really glad that Chris Agoyan is getting everyone really paranoid about location data because they will that'll distract them from this technology we're actually relying more on for the super secret terrorists. Should we do one more person or is it Brian? Um it's five or two, you can do another one. One more, there's just in the back. Well, we had some comments uh, earlier this week from uh, Judge Richard Posner of the Seventh Circuit, mm -hmm. uh, where he said that it should be illegal for people to manufacture devices that don't have a government back door in their encryption. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, uh, I'm not attacking that head on, I'm asking how widespread is this belief in government and on the bench that a government backdoor can't be used by non-government entities? So I don't think Judge Posner went into the weeds that far. I think he said that he was shocked that the government would let people sell technology that could not be intercepted. Um, certainly uh, Comey's, uh, uh, FBI Director Comey's remarks at Brookings a month and a half ago where he reframed the term rule of law to apply it to, to really mean all data should be within the reach of law enforcement uh, was, I think, uh, both insightful and troubling. Um, you know, we, we haven't had, a, again, a robust debate about this as a, as a society about whether, whether there should be some forms of data that are truly off limits to the government. Uh, there have always been forms of data that are off limits to law enforcement from you know, the earliest days of this of this country, you know, Jefferson and Madison were encrypting letters with, you know, they weren't using AES, but they were they were encrypting in some cases using uh, encryption algorithms that Jefferson himself had designed. I mean, we forget that early drafts of the First Amendment sent between Jefferson and Madison were sent in encrypted letters. And I think what's most interesting there is even after the United States became the United States and it was no longer, you know, a fear of British interception, they kept encrypting because they were worried about the postmaster general who was a notorious snoop who was compiling dossiers and using them for political means. Um, encryption has a, uh, you know, a strong history uh, in, in this country. And I think you know, if the government wants to start making it difficult for people to use that technology or to threaten the ability of people to sell, provide that technology to others, I think that's a really, really big step. And I think that that's one that should be subject to public debate and shouldn't just, you know, take place because the FBI decides to wag its finger at a few people. Uh, so, you know, there has been no no law passed making it uh, prohibited. And in fact, the one law on the books on this technology, the Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act, CALEA, expressly protects the right of companies to build end-to-end -end encryption into their products with keys that they don't have. And so, you know, if the FBI doesn't like that, not only do they need to get a law passed, they need to get a law removed before they can uh, they can do anything. And so, you know, for now... Or just go overseas. 
for now, encryption is is, is safe. Uh, you know, going overseas is not as good as just having encryption you can trust. I, I don't want to have keys held by anyone. So, and I think that there's a tendency that we have in in this space to have these fly by night companies or these snake oil salesmen say, "Oh, look, we're we're a Swiss company, therefore we're trustworthy." And just because you have a PO box in Switzerland or you yeah. know open an office there it doesn't mean that you're naturally trustworthy and Swiss surveillance law isn't actually that that great uh, neither is German uh, we should you know remember many of these countries are willing partners of the NSA and I was actually trying to make a slightly different point which is go someplace where they can get the data and, you know um, which doesn't defeat end -end encryption but I think that the, the government is going to continue to find other loopholes you know and and I don't know whether that's a better thing or not you know, to force them into more difficult loopholes. I mean, but, you know, Posner wrote in 2009 in, in uh, um, Gonzalez, oh no, Garcia, was the, was the case, technological progress poses a threat to privacy by by essentially lowering the cost of surveillance. And, you know, I, I like the old Posner more than the new one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we should wrap right. it up. That's a nice way to end it. Um, and uh, so we're just, yeah. Um, Sun has set. Chris's beautiful sunset has gone away. Um, so thank you all for coming again. The next event's going to be January 22nd. I hope you'll stick around for a glass of wine or a cold beer, which we will have outside. Um, I am told that I need to mention that we have a website that is launching globally next week, mibeingtracked.com, which will let you know if you are um, have the super, super cookie on your phone and if your provider is actually tracking you. Um, so if that is part of the conversation that you are interested in, I recommend that you all mosey on over at some point. And thank you, and thank all of you, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our